as someone who doesn't necessarily serve the Omnissiah, but someone who can appreciate them, you will not be getting my legs today, as I will be replacing them with various things depending on which faction we are currently talking about to add a little bit more context and possible comedy to whatever the hell I am currently doing. So. Hello everybody, my name is Bricky, and this is going to be a long video and a large project that has been going on for quite some time. This is... I need two hands for this. This is every single Warhammer 40k race in kind of a nutshell, explained, a little bit of explanation, a little bit of lore, a little bit of talking about the tabletop, mostly lore, what they're all about, and also a little bit of background for those of you who just have no clue what Warhammer 40,000 is. Now you see, Warhammer and Warhammer 40,000 is a universe people hear plenty of, but don't know a whole lot about. They see, oh, there's these dudes in big power armor with chainsaw swords, and they got these big old green orcs, and there's some bugs over there, and everyone calls calls these guys weaves, and then there's these spiky bitches over here, and I, I don't get it. I don't understand. Where do I start? Well, this video is particularly for you, or for those of you who have a little bit of knowledge, but you're kind of curious about each of the different races and factions in Warhammer. So, overall, the Warhammer universe is vast when it comes to lore and background and each different faction is so different with the things that they believe in and some are human some are transhuman like where they all have all these crazy ass electronics on them you've got aliens and you've got the chaos factions and there's so much to entail that i decided to embark on this project to tell you what each and every single one of them is about and what the warhammer universe is about as well to give at least a little bit of an intro to this extremely bloated, but very, very enjoyable world that I and many others partake in. So, I will be explaining every single faction in the Warhammer 40k universe, at least all the factions you can play as, and some smaller factions here and there. I will not be discussing absolutely everything in it, because that is a little bit much, and I'm not going to go too mega deep into the lore. I'm going to give you a pretty solid overview of each of the different factions, and have you learn a little bit about them, and we'll discuss a little bit of the tabletop as well, in case you are curious about that. But for this episode entirely, we are discussing the Imperium of Man, because that takes up a fat chunk of Warhammer lore. Oh, boo what is Warhammer 40,000? Well, the 40,000 starts off is the year 40,000. The 41st millennium, that's where it takes place, is in the year 40,000, 41,000 AD. You're already more knowledgeable. Let me read you a quote, first of many quotes in this video. It is the 41st millennium. For more than a hundred years, the Emperor has sat immobile on the golden throne of Earth. He is the master of mankind by the will of the gods, and master of a million worlds by the might of his inexhaustible armies. He is a rotting carcass, writhing invisibly with power from the dark age of technology. He is the carrion lord of the Imperium, for whom a thousand souls are sacrificed every day so that he may never truly die. To be a man in such times is to be amongst untold billions. It is to live in the cruelest and most bloody regime imaginable. These are the tales of those times. Forget the power of technology and science, for so much has been forgotten, never to be relearned. Forget the promise of progress and understanding, for in the grim, dark future, there is only war. There is no peace amongst the stars, only an eternity of carnage and slaughter and the laughter of thirsting gods. Everything blows. And it blows fucking hard. Warhammer is probably the most dark and depressing universes ever in fiction. Or at least like, like top three. Everything is so absurdly horrible, destructive, or overpowered that it all kind of ends up canceling itself out. It's like Dota. War rages across the galaxy. Interstellar travel is only possible due to sacrificing a thousand souls a day to a rotting carcass of a man who you believe to be your god. Demonic gods and just demons tear open the fabric of reality on a whim. Other Xenos 
or even other humans end up killing each other in untold billions across the galaxy. It is a time of unending war, slaughter, and a bloodbath amongst everybody. Planets are deemed unrecoverable and are completely destroyed on a whim. Everything sucks, but that's like the charm of it. See, everything in Warhammer is evil. But being evil is kind of fun. Like, humanity, in its own right, is a xenophobic, prejudiced, and religious zealot group that kill each other just as much as they kill all of their enemies. But And they're like mid, mid to high tier evil on the evil scale of Warhammer. Nobody is good. No matter who you are, everyone is at some flavor, some color of evil. Whoever you pick, you are going to be the bad guy. But that's the fun of it. Because being the bad guy is badass. Villains are cool. They look cool, they got cool outfits, they got cool weapons, they got cool armies. Villains are cool, man. And when everyone is a villain, everyone is pretty cool. That's what makes this so charming, is that everyone can be the bad guy. So let's start off talking about the main bad guy, quote unquote, the Imperium of Man. His hair, whack. His gear, whack. The Imperium of Man is the main empire of the human race. All of humanity is under this one flag called the Imperium. And about 10,000 years ago, there was a man. He was the Emperor, the Emperor of Mankind, a 10-foot-tall psychic demigod who led humanity across the stars to colonize tons and tons of worlds, create superhuman soldiers, and really bring humanity into a new age. This man, the Emperor of Mankind, was a Psyker. And a Psyker is like a magician of sorts. In the world of 40k, there is the Warp, the Immaterium, kind of like Hell, but sort of like a purgatory dimension of Hell. And a Psyker is someone who can take that power and manifest it through their mind to use it to do stuff. Well, like witchcraft stuff, magician stuff, spells, and lots of other things, but we don't want to get too into that. The Emperor, big boy Psyker. Top tier, A+, plus, maybe even S. Now the Emperor created a bunch of sons. Yes, created a bunch of sons known as the Primarchs. He created 20, 18, 18 Primarchs to have them lead all of the different legions of humanity to the different stars and plans to help colonize and bring it out. These Primarchs are basically like little versions of the Emperor. Not all of them are Psychers, but a lot of them are very, very powerful, and they lead his special Space Marine legions. Then this big clusterfuck happened called the Horus Heresy, where the Emperor's favorite son, the Primarch, Horus, ended up joining Chaos and leading nine other, well, I guess eight, nine of the 18, half, half of his Primarchs directly to Earth to fight down the Emperor himself. Now, if you want to know what chaos is, remember what I mentioned earlier, the warp, that immaterium, the hellish place? In there relies the four chaos gods. Imagine like Satan and three other Satans. The warp being kind of evil, those chaos gods, that's the reason. And so those chaos gods manipulated Horus, and then Horus helped manipulate all eight other Primarchs to lead this giant coup directly on the Emperor on Earth. And they fucked up shit. After this huge civil war, Horus died, but not before brutally wounding the Emperor. And right at the end of his life, they put the Emperor on this large golden throne on Earth, in which he is now alive, just barely, but slowly rotting away, powering something called the Astronomicon, so long as he stays alive, and is fed a thousand people a day. The Astronomicon is like the North Star. If you want to do interstellar travel in 40k, you need to pass through that demonic warp I mentioned earlier. But how do you know where you're going? Well, the Emperor is there putting a nice little navigator right there. He helps navigate you to know where you're going. If you want to go from Earth to some crazy solar system across the way, you need to go through that warp and then you need to know where you're going, go through there and pop your way out. It's like uh, doing nether travel. In, in Minecraft so you can shorten the distance between going to areas. So long as the Emperor is alive and being fed a thousand people a day to stay alive, you can do that. The moment he dies, interstellar travel's gone for all of humanity. 
you're so boned. Now, since the Horus Heresy 10,000 years ago, the Imperium has fallen from grace substantially. All technology has started to dwindle and die. There is now giant fundamental religious extremists that now believe the Emperor of Mankind was a deity, a true living god, which is probably the last thing the Emperor would have wanted to be remembered for. So now you have this thing called the Ecclesiarchy, which is this giant church entirely devoted to spreading the good word of the Emperor. He is now the Holy Emperor God, the God Emperor of mankind, and all of the Imperium has taken up worshipping him to the fullest extent and killing anything that isn't humanity in his name. The Imperium has this futuristic gothic tone to it and a hefty religious zealotry to them. If you think anything against the Emperor, that's heresy and you deserve to die. That is called being a heretic. Heretics die in 40k. There is no such thing as freedom of religion. There is no such thing as freedom of speech, so long as you are against the emperor. There is no such thing as any kind of tolerance. Everyone is a religious zealot. Some more than others, but no matter what, you preach in that good word. So right now, Everyone in humanity is trying to expand their empire across the stars. If you are a heretic, someone who doesn't believe in the Emperor, you are deserving of death. If you believe in the Chaos Gods, you are also a heretic and you deserve death. If you are an alien race of any kind, you are a filthy Xenos and you deserve death as well. So long as the murder continues and humanity expands, the Imperium of Man is very, very happy. However, the largest fighting force of this Imperium is my personal favorite faction, and the first faction we will discuss, the Astra Militarum, or also known as the Imperial Guard. Pretty shit now, man! You finished? That's it, man. Game over, man! The Imperial Guard is the main fighting force of the Imperium, and in a world of horrifying creatures, galactic monstrosities, the literal demons themselves breaking through the fabric of time to kill you, the Imperial Guard are untold billions of regular men and women wearing modern day, like, flak armor with a laser rifle. This is the humble Laz gun the main weapon of the Imperial Guard. It fires superheated plasma lasers at an extremely fast fire rate. It is reliable, never jams. It can blow off limbs, giant holes in concrete. It is overall an extremely devastating weapon in modern day. It is one of the weakest in the 40K universe. Yeah, a, a laser rifle that never jams, it could blow off limbs, one of the weakest weapons. That's the world we're in right now. But who cares? Because the Imperial Guard has, in each battle, 500,000 of these men and women. 30,000 large armored tanks, 10,000 artillery batteries. The Imperial Guard wins through sheer numbers and firepower. They kind of have this World War I, World War II style aesthetic with legions of guardsmen as well as high company commanders and generals on the field along with them and multiple kinds of troops. A normal Imperial Guard battle starts off with artillery, long lines of artillery cracking the crust of the planet underneath the enemy's feet. And as this barrage continues, hundreds of thousands of guardsmen, sea, a sea of guardsmen, surges forward, firing and charging at everything possible while the planet rumbles as tanks roll up behind them. Gunships block out the sun and tanks block out the dirt with the steps and hoof prints of millions of guardsmen. It is through numbers and sheer sundering firepower. They are the first and last line of defense for the Imperium and make up a huge bulk of the battles. The Imperial Guard is also made up of tons of different kinds of regiments. The Katachin jungle fighters live in a death world that it's more hospitable than almost any firefight they'll ever get into. So they just have this steroid looking giant knife Rambo predator looking sons of bitches where nothing is anywhere near as scary as a simple knight on their home planet. You have the Valhallen Winter Soldiers who haven't felt their toes in 300 years. The Mordian Iron Guard who are more interested in making their shoes shine than actually fighting a battle. And then of course the big one, the Cadians from Cadia. <coughs> 
the biggest export of guardsmen in the entirety of the Imperium. You will fire your first gun at 5. You will disassemble and reassemble it at 10. You will have pounding artillery drills day in and day out at 15. And you'll fight your first Swarm Lord at 16. And if you mention Cadia, you will burst into an unrelenting amount of tears and sadness like I do daily. To quote, I have at my command an entire battle group of the Imperial Guard. 50 regiments including specialized drop troops, stealthers, mechanized formations, armored companies, combat engineers, and mobile artillery. Over half a million fighting men and 30,000 tanks and artillery pieces are mine to command. Emperor show mercy to the fool that stands against me, for I shall not. The Imperial Guard are my personal favorite faction in 40k. They're the army I collect the most, the ones I enjoy playing the most, and the one I enjoy in the lore sense a lot. There's something about just a regular man with a laser rifle being told to charge the horrors of this universe and willingly doing so for his god emperor. It's just poetic. They actually represent the main Imperial Guard tactics pretty well. Large amounts of artillery that doesn't require a line of sight, lots of tanks, tons of infantry, drop troops, and gunships. Overall, they're pretty similar to how they sound, though a little bit expensive to collect, unfortunately. And they don't hit a lot. They have a bit of a bad aim, but you don't really care because you're just drowning them in shots. However, if you want more accurate fire and specialization, we can move on to talk about Spitzmarines. The Angels of Death are up next. Space Marines are genetically engineered super soldiers and superhumans. They're given extra organs, their skin tissue is toughened, their bones are stronger, they're taller than the average person. They're pretty massive people, and these are the specialized super soldiers that carry out a lot of the more specific tasks for the Imperium. And there's tons of legions of them. In fact, there's one per Primarch. Each Primarch, the Emperor's son, as I mentioned before, oversees their legion of space marines. The genetic upgrade they get is based on the genes of said Primarch. It's something called a gene seed. That's what brings them up to this, like, superhuman level. As stated, each Primarch has their own legion. A uh, robot girly man has the Ultramarines. Jagatai Khan has the White Scars. A uh, Rogel Dorn has the Imperial Fists. Corvus Korax has the Raven Guard. And there's a whole bunch of other side sections that are all also extremely interesting and have a little bit more of a twist on the average Space Marines, which we will discuss in a bit. Humorously enough, I don't have a whole lot to say about Space Marines. They're superhumanly fast. In, in fact, it's been said that nothing that large should move that quick. These men in power armor moving at blazing fast speeds, their reflexes are faster, their skin is tougher. They are overall just extremely powerful soldiers. In fact, where they differ comes down to which Space Marine Legion we're talking about. For instance, the Ultramarines done by Robot Girlman, Gilliman, Gil Gil Ugh are the main blue boys. Strong in almost every way, the jack-of-all-trades kind of group that are a little bit too strong, and that's a lore problem, but... Mm, uh. The White Scars by Jagatai Khan are all about speed freaks. Go fast. We're talking attack bikes. We're talking land speeders. You want to go in quick. You want to hit them hard. You want them to be swarming around like buzz flies. Buzz, buzz, saw, buzz saws. With the speed of buzz saws. Fuck you, Pale King. Salamanders love fire. Fire in the forge, fire in battle. Flamers, melta guns, multi meltas. Just so long as something can be burning, that's big. And they're also actually some of the nicest of the Space Marines. A lot of Space Marines have this kind of like holier than thou thing because of their genetic strength. However, the Salamanders tend to put human lives above the lives of themselves, which is actually rather rare. They're also all black, but not like just regular black, like, like 2 a.m line at a white castle black like they have a charcoal dark ashy exterior and blazing red eyes apparently something about living on their home planet of nocturne which i don't know if that makes much sense but who cares this is like fantasy land anyway overall salamanders are actually one of my personal favorite legions because they're just really cool they're fun to play as because of all their flamer weapons and they have a nice like more heartwarming lore 
as opposed to being super evil like everyone else is. Oh my god, we're not even a quarter of the way through the Space Marine Legions. Uh, Imperial Fists believe in the power of the siege and defensive positions. Uh, Raven Guards, master of stealth and sabotage while having burn helmets. Iron Hands, masters of machines and vehicles while being really goddamn good at being sold on eBay after one nerf. Space Wolves, uh, Vikings and wolves and tons of wolves and, and axes, battle axes, fur everywhere. Space Wolves, so angry, big teeth, ah. Blood Angels, the genetic defect to make them want to drink blood and go crazy, called the Red Thirst. They have Cupid wings and stuff, which is a little bit strange, and they are all super gay for Sanguinius. Dark Angels are old school knights and inner circle theme and... Are you a heretic? Me? No, never. Once from the blue moon, I know. Death Watch, a fancy pantsy anti Xenos group that nobody plays because Death Watch and they look cool though, but no one, no one plays them. I don't know about Death Watch. They're, they're, they're there though. Black Templars, for the people who, if you haven't prayed at least three times a day, you're gonna start praying out that airlock. And I'm sure there's some other chapters I may have missed as well, like Crimson Fists and stuff, but those are the main ones right here. Here, here, quote from the Emperor himself. They shall be my finest warriors, these men who give of themselves to me. Like clay I shall mold them, and in the furnace of war I shall forge them. They shall be of iron will and steely sinew. In great armor I shall clad them, and with the mightiest weapons shall they be armed. They will be untouched by plague or disease, no sickness shall blight them. They shall have such tactics, strategies, and machines that no foe will best them in battle. They are my bulwark against the terror, they are my defenders of humanity, they are my space marines, and they shall know no fear. And on the tabletop, they fuck. Oh, they fuck hard. As of making this video, Space Marines are laughably strong. That might change at some point, but overall, Space Marines just have the, it's like a Swiss army knife, a tool for anything you need, except it's like a gold-plated Swiss army knife. It is extremely strong. If you are actually getting into the tabletop of Warhammer, Space Marines are a great start. Also, whatever gameplay style you have, whether you want to be sit back with long range and heavy weaponry, go fast and run in, or even just full melee, all of these options are totally there for you. Space Marines are super badass, but unfortunately, it's time we start praying to our new god, the 2011 Honda Civic. So is it any wonder people are afraid of technology? Technology! The Adeptus Mechanicus. The Adeptus Mechanicus are a technophile cult on Mars. Now, these people are a little bit weird because they don't actually really believe in the Emperor of Mankind. And you might think, oh, whoa, 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 Berkey, that sounds like some heresy. A little bit. They believe in the Emperor, they believe in his power, but they don't pray to him. They pray to something called the Omnissiah. And the Omnissiah is this kind of machine god that they believe permeates in all machines. And if you think, well, wait a minute, they believe in a different god as well? That sounds like super heresy. Well, yes-ish, but they also make all your guns and they make all your tanks, and they make everything that you have, so you can't really tell them to fuck off, because you're not gonna win nothing if you don't got stuff to shoot people with. See, their Omnissiah at least makes sense from their standpoint. They believe it to be a deity that permeates through all machines, your Honda Civic, your standard bolt gun, your Dune Strider Walker, your giant mechs, your huge ships. The Omnissiah is present through all. And the only reason your stuff works is because the machine spirit in it says it works. If you want your gun to work, your tank to run, you must pray to it. And I mean full stop. You need to start chanting in high gothic. You need to burn incense. You need to sit on your knees and pray to that car. You need to rub oil on your robes and you need to go ahomina, 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 ahomina. Full stop if you want your damn thing to work. If you want your gun to fire, you need to do that. They are very bizarre and they actually have a bit of a point because it's obviously working. And if you look at them, I don't know how that works. 
so they obviously know something about what they're doing. The most notable member of the Adidas Mechanicus is Arch Magos, Magos, whatever, Belisarius Call. Look at this, look at this dude. Look at this dude. Yeah, that, this is the group we're talking about. These are these weirdos. Here, the Omniscient Creed. The, the, the Credo, Credo, eh, Omniscient. There is no truth in flesh, only betrayal. There is no strength in flesh, only weakness. There is no constancy in flesh, only decay. There is no certainty in flesh, but death. Flesh is weakness, flesh is death. The Omnissiah is the god of the machines, and if you wish to be whole, if you wish to be holy, if you wish to give unto him, you must saw down your limbs and remove your organs and replace them with mechanical parts because that is what he wants and that is how you will become enlightened. Hard technophiles mixed with religious extremism. That's just Mechanicus. Now for their army side of things, they are with the Skitari. The Skitari operate with very bizarre weaponry and lots of different kinds of vehicles, tanks, and different people in between. They're very weird, uh, but they have extremely wacky and, and enjoyable, and in fact quite effective both in the real game and in the lore, weaponry and gear. Overall, as an army on the tabletop, they're very weird and have a whole bunch of different shenanigans, but if you like kind of that quirky, wacky techno thing, I'd give them a pickup. Hell, they're so paranoid, I, I gotta keep going. They're so paranoid and crazy. These dune striders you see right here, one guy was able to make them work. One guy and he died. And they're so scared they'll never work again that they keep them on and they never turn them off and they run around in a circle the whole time until they need them and then they corral it and they go into battle. Yep, the Adeptus Mechanicus. Now, if you wanna talk about faith though, Oh, oh. Let's talk about the Sisters of Battle. A simp has fallen for an eagle in Lego City. The Sisters of Battle of the Adeptus Sororitas, if that's how I pronounce it correctly, is an all-female group of battle sisters going through the Ecclesiarchy section of the Imperium. The Ecclesiarchy is, of course, the church. This is, imagine a private army of the church, which is scary. And it is. The sisters are an extremely zealotous force, and they take this to a full extreme. They believe in three main things, faith, martyrdom, and fire. Through the bolter, the flamer, and the melta, the sisters of battle are extremely potent at taking out chaos and heretics. Mainly heretics, because as they are a fighting section of the Ecclesiarchy Church, that's the big thing they want to kill. Any form of heretic will face the Emperor's justice through those three main weapons, the Bolter, the Flamer, and the Melta, and they will do so with extreme prejudice. Literally. They are the closest things we have to nuns in space. And I'm talking hardcore nuns. They carry holy fire on their backs. They have holy like books and sigils all across their armor. Their main battle tank is a fucking pipe organ missile launcher. They have small babies that they have like removed their brain capacity to make them little servant cherubs to fly around and give them ammunition and shit. They drop churches from low orbit as many drop pods onto battles. They drop churches into battles and they blare war hymns and holy music from their frigates in low atmosphere and shower holy water across the battlefield. These are the people you are dealing with and they're fucking awesome. They can literally stave off demons on the tabletop because their faith is that strong. Remember the warp, the demons from the warp? Well, the warp also manifests in your mind. All of your emotions, negative and positive, go through the warp. It's the immaterium, the place of all things. So if you are that mentally fortified, that mentally strong, you can stave off horrifying demons. And all these girls, oh, not a crack. Not a crack in that mental armor. Now, as much as a meme as they are, and as much as their models look a lot like Ongo, Ongo Gabloglian, yeah, which I can't unsee anymore. I gotta say, 
I love their design. I think they're extremely cool. They're another army that I'm currently collecting. They just released a whole new line of figures very recently, and they look wonderful. Everything from Celestine, the living, literally undying saint, from the Triumph of St. Catherine, which is literally a funeral procession as a model. Those organ tanks I mentioned earlier. This shit is the most over-the-top badassery in a lot of the Warhammer universe, and goddammit is it over-the-top. But Sisters of Battle are so cool. While I'm a guardsman at heart, oh, this is such a cool faction. By Bolter Shell, Flamer Burst, and Melta Blast, the Mutant, the Heretic, and the Traitor alike are cleansed of their sin of existence. So it has been for five millennia, so shall it be until the end of time. And speaking of burning demons. I can see! I can fight! The Grey Knights are the first army I actually collected back in 7th edition. The Grey Knights are a super secretive and much more old school look at power armored knights. Except they are all psychers. All of them have that crazy space magic magician shit. For every 100,000 Guardsmen, there's one Grey Knight. For every 10,000 Sisters of Battle, there's one Grey Knight. For every 1,000 Space Marines, there's one Grey Knight. Grey Knights are the strongest of the strong, both in mental will and absolute just strength. These are Space Marines that are all high-level psychers, all of them able to specifically do one goal, and that is kill demons. The Emperor believed that the Demons of Chaos were the number one threat to the Imperium, and he probably is right. However, this group is entirely based on doing that through a myriad of tactics. Coming from the planet, or I guess the moon, of Titan in the Soul System, the Grey Knights are thrown through extremely rigorous training and are as clear of mind and soul as they possibly can be. Since the demons of the warp are the warp and your mind projects to the warp, people can go insane very fast, especially lower level psychers. These Grey Knights need to be able to harness the warp in the presence of demons and stay perfectly sane. One of their characters, one of my favorite characters, is named Castellan Crow. He has a demon blade, the Black Blade of Mahamahama, and he has to have it on him because it tempts everyone nearby, constantly beckoning them, use my power, use my strength, suck my penis, whatever the possibility. And so he has to keep it on him all the time as this thing whispers to him consistently and he has to stave it off forever being alone in his chambers or on the battlefield because anyone who gets too close to it might be tempted a little too hard he is that pure of heart and mind and all the characters in the gray knights are basically like that the only issue is that um gray knights have a scorched earth policy you know more ways than one if they're fighting demons demons corrupt and make people crazy so if i'm a guardsman and I'm fighting demons, and the Grey Knights arrive, and they kill all the demons. I'm a risk. And so, guess who's not making it out of there? <laughs> On the tabletop, they're very strike fast, strike hard kind of people. They teleport all around the place. They are fast strike groups, small amounts of models because they're so dang strong. You only have so many characters, but with it, you get in there, you're very tough, very tanky, you hit really hard, and you try to bounce around the battlefield quickly, but you don't have numbers, and so every dead Grey Knight hits really damn hard. They're fun, though, if you like that kind of uh, fast-striking kind of army. Oh, and also, uh, Kaldor Drago is a thing. We're not even going to get into Kaldor Drago. All right, that is, uh, oh my goodness gracious. I am the hammer. I am the male about his fist. I am the spear in his hand. Though we are lost, I am the shield on his arm. I am the flight of his arrows. I am the hammer. I am the sword. I am the shield. I am a soldier at the battle at the end of time. Grey Knights are pretty hardcore. They are as holy as you can get for a Space Marine. If you like Space Marines and you want to, you know, that they're holy enough, you want to be holier, Grey Knights. Now, if you want to be holier and big, let's talk Imperial Knights. Oh, Lord, he coming! Do you like gigantic walkers the size of homes or medium-sized buildings? Do you want to kill heretics, but you want to kill like 40 of them per turn? 
Do you want a gigantic old school knight noble house style of walkers with giant chainsaw arms? Then you got Imperial Knights. Imperial Knights, it's not a whole lot to talk about them because they're just gigantic walkers, but they have this old school like house feel to them. Like literally like they're houses. Each Imperial Knight comes from a house and each of them act in their own special way. These behemoth of walkers also destroy almost everything in their path, killing full swaths of squads in a couple shots, stepping on legions of troops. Like these things do not mess around and they look so cool. Imperial Knights and Chaos Knights actually for that matter don't have a whole lot to discuss. They're just super big heavy walkers and they look different depending on your house or Chaos God you currently believe in. And overall these things are just really cool if you want to murder everything in your path. They're the big scary big unit of Warhammer and if you want to collect them go to town. They make for a great painting project too. Game over back down to earth. Let's talk something about a little bit uh, a little bit different a little more gold. If guardsmen are regular soldiers, space marines are super soldiers, gray knights are super super soldiers, the adeptus custodes are super soldiers cubed. The adeptus custodes are the third major army I own. I, I know three armies. I know I, I, I got carried away. Okay, but that, that's all. I only have three. Okay. It's... Ugh. They are our final brand of Space Marines, but these ones are super special, okay? If a Guardsman is six foot, a Space Marine is seven feet, a Custodian is eight feet. These are the giant defenders of Holy Terra, which is also Earth. Earth is Terra, Earth, Terra, themselves. These are the people that literally guard the Emperor's throne room, hence Custodes. These boys protect the Emperor's throne room at all times and are literally like handcrafted people. They're not humans brought up by a gene seer or something. These are all handcrafted super soldiers. I think from a tube. These behemoth of men are like eight feet, eight and a half feet tall and functionally immortal. They stand still, spear in hand for hundreds of years without the need to sleep and barely even the need to eat watching over the throne room and every other area of Holy Terra for their entire purpose in life. And oh my lord, are they terrifying. These custodians put space marines to shame. If you liked your super soldiers, these are your super mega soldiers. One of these men can take on probably three space marines and most likely win. There are many different groups of custodians as well, like the Solar Watch, or there's also one of my personal favorite, the Aquilan Shield. The Aquilan Shield go out to seemingly unimportant individuals and protect them because they believe that they are going to be doing something very important in their lives. For instance, let's say a, a regular guardsman gets the protection of this giant eight and a half foot tall golden god because that guardsman will end up becoming a general one day or something of that nature. The custodians work in mysterious ways and are almost always outnumbered but never outmatched. These people are pretty horrifying both on the tabletop as well as in the lore. There are very few of them however and there's actually an extremely small amount of them but that's kind of the point. There's only so many of these people that can have war gear this strong weapons this powerful and training this good and the custodians have all three of it for 100 years i stood my watch amidst the somber shadows of the sanctum imperialis i was still as a statue but always ready always attuned to dangers unseen days months years passed by in a frenzied blur beyond those walls yet within little moved and nothing changed for 100 years i did not but wait yet had any threat appeared i would have struck it down in a heartbeat for 100 years i stood my watch and as it ends i can tell you this patience is a weapon the custodians are the top dogs of the Imperium and they hurt just that same way. Though I do want to discuss a little bit about the Sisters of Silence before we get out of here. Because the Sisters of Silence I also have a few of and they're really fun but they don't get enough attention. These kind of bald plume ladies are a whole group of pariahs or also known as blanks. We'll be referring to them as blanks from now on. So as every mind is somewhat connected to the warp, these blanks are a genetic mutation that is, has it suppressed 
heavily. Because of that mind suppression, normal people feel this weird, like, uncomfortable nature when around them. When a sister of silence walks past them, you feel ill. You feel just uncomfortable and strange. So most of them don't actually live past childhood, because once they are birthed, they're, well, you know, killed or something at a very young age because they just emit a horrifying aura. These ladies, however, are guardians of the throne as well for more psychic threats. See, none of the custodians are psychers, so they have a difficult time dealing with major demons and other kinds of psychic phenomena. These sisters are extremely specialized in it, all of them taking a vow of silence as they don't speak, hence the term sisters of silence, but they communicate through hand gestures and things of that nature. But if there's a demon issue, if there's any kind of warp-based problem, the sisters are extremely adept at dealing with them thanks to their blank gene. They normally work a lot of time with the custodians because they have to deal with both kinds of threats, but they're not represented that way on the tabletop. In fact, they only have like one real model for them, which is very unfortunate. I hope they'll get something new soon because I think they should really be working together as it is that way in the lore, but hopefully we'll get there soon. But if we're talking about blanks, let's talk assassins. been a long video we're about to round it out we got this and one more human thing and then we're done the assassins though the officio assassinorum oh boy these people are deadly yeah, they're called assassins they should be but oh man these people will mess you up so these are from the Officio Assassinorum, a very special organization, and they are handpicked by the Grand Master of the Officio Assassinorum from the shit, what was it called? Scola Progenium. It's basically an orphan school. If your parents got murdered by demons or something, you get sent to this and you get trained to be whatever. A uh, Tempestus Drop Troop, uh, an Inquisitor maybe even. Uh, maybe you get a blank gene and you get thrown into the Sisters of Silence, or sometimes you just disappear. When you are taken, however, you go to one of four temples because the Assassinorum works in the temple style of things. Each, these temples are the Vindicare, Caluxus, Calidus, and Eversor temples. Let's start with the Vindicare. I'm far away. I've been sitting here for three weeks. Poof! The Vindicare Temple is the main sniper based temple. Gigantic sniper rifles for all these assassins. Their whole point is to be able to be in a spot and sit there, eye in scope, for weeks, waiting for their perfect target, taking people out from literal miles away after extremely long time periods. The Vindicare Temple is about precise, perfect aim. There have been reports of Vindicares being able to single out particular body parts from over two, three miles away. Temples in the head, the jugular, for instance, and been sitting there after weeks. And when they're ready, take that shot. Time is done. Packs them up. The Calidus Temple, however, is a lot more about shape-shifting and deviant art. It's mostly a female-based one, or at least it seems to be, and this allows a lot of body augmentation for certain individuals to be able to kind of transmorph themselves and infiltrate areas that are problems. These assassins will end up taking missions that take them years, two, three years, to infiltrate a heretical group and slowly work their way up just to get enough time to put a bullet into the main target's head and then escape unharmed, or become the main target and sabotage it from within. These are all completely about deception, mind tricks, polymorphing, and everything in between. And uh, lots of drawings, lots of drawings. The Eversor Temple, just kind of disturbing one. The Eversor Temple is about when you don't want anything to come back alive, friend or foe. You want it all dead. An Eversor is psychogenically conditioned with just psychotherapy and psychological torture to only feel violence, hatred, and anger. It does the clockwork orange style of thing of just making you forced to watch never-ending pain and misery and, and psycho conditioning, I guess is the term. And then they pump you full of tons of psychedelic drugs and they cryo-freeze you and then they drop you in an area where they just want to make sure everything is dead. And then you defrost, 
full of just all this insane, mind-boggling psychotherapy and, and psychedelic drugs, and you just go to town. Yeah, if you, you don't care if anyone comes back alive. You're like, all right, lost cause, send them in. Finally, there's the most bizarre temple, the Calexus Temple. The Calexus assassins are feared even among the other temples. So that blank gene, the people will go to the Calexus Temple with this as well. And this is where they can harness that to be massively anti-psyker or even just anti-regular people. They are seen with extreme fear and uh, distrust among many, many people. They are described by the Eldar, by quote, as being pure evil. Imagine that uncomfortable feeling from that blank gene I mentioned, and then imagine them being taught and given equipment to amplify it by a hundred. If normally regular people feel uncomfortable, now they are basically akin to being a siren wailing directly in your ear. And if you're a psyker, Oh no, the sheer presence of a Klux assassin is enough for you to tear your skin off. You will rather gouge your eyes out and rip your nails off than even being near this person. The Klux assassin is when you want psychers to literally lose their minds and they will go on their knees and ask you to gun them down because it is a suitable choice over being anywhere near you. The motto of that temple is, that which is unknown and unseen commands the greatest fear. Now for the tabletop, assassins aren't that special. You can call them in no matter what Imperium faction you are. And they do a lot of work for themselves, but at the same time, they're very specialized and require a lot of finesse. And they work the way you generally want them to though. You wanna cause some distortion and weird stuff, you take a Calidus. You wanna just murder swaths of infantry and then blow up Eversor. You wanna kill that one guy, Vindicare, and if you have a lot of psychers, Caluxus. It's a nice little like jack of all trades if you have a specific thing you wanna kill. And you get to choose which, which is really fun. But now, let's talk about the last human faction. We can round this video out before we do part two. The Inquisition. And we have a lot to talk about with them. Well, on the subject of heresy! Oh boy. Where do I even begin with the Inquisition? Take, take every secret police you can think of. Uh, the KGB, the Gestapo, the CIA, FBI, any of these kinds of people. And then mark it up by about 10 and give them the most power in the entire Imperium. No, you know what? How about this? This, this right here, it's a, not just a quote. This is the Imperial motto, the motto of the Inquisition. I apologize for my bad pronunciation. Innocentia nihil probat. Innocence proves nothing. The most powerful organization in the Imperium, the secret police, their number one motto is innocence proves nothing. The Inquisition goes around like the secret police or like detectives to find issues in the Imperium. And they have different Ordos, depending on which one we're talking about. The Ordo Hereticus, the Ordo Xenos, uh, the Ordo Malleus, for instance, and a whole bunch of other ones. Hereticus is obvious, they deal with heretics. Xenos tries to find alien threats, and Malleus is demons. They all have different specializations in what they're trying to go for as this Inquisitor. And that's what they're called, Inquisitors. Each of them, as an Inquisitor, has their own free reign to do as they wish. They may have a ship and a crew, and they go out to find problems and interrogate people a lot. They are above the law in every department over space marines. Now the space marines might argue against them and stuff and there might be a lot of blowback but technically they are above them as inquisitors. They are looking to investigate and figure out coups and cults and demonic incursions and possible Xenos issues like gene stealers or a new uh, threat coming into an area. They're about learning that stuff and actually doing detective work. And memes aside, they're pretty good at it. The Inquisition having all of this power does make them a little bit power hungry and frantic sometimes. And yes, it is still a bad thing, but most of them are pretty good at their job. And they spend a lot of time being very diligent to make sure that all of these leads they follow are proper and correct. They're basically space detectives with just enormous power and sometimes a bit of a power complex. And we haven't even talked about Exterminatus yet. Exterminatus. 
Exterminatus is deeming a planet unfit to be saved. I deem that this planet is demon infested and taking it back will cost too many resources and is not worth it. I have now committed exterminatus on this planet. I will now sign the death warrant of an entire Imperium planet as it is unfit to take and better to be destroyed than allow the enemy to hold it. This can mean saturation bombardment. This can mean cracking the planet's core and breaking it apart. Doesn't matter. Render this planet inhospitable to all life. Yes, the innocence proves nothing people are the only people who can choose. This planet must die in its entirety. Yeah, you're playing the villain. <laughs> Now it is memed a lot, but most Inquisitors are very rare to do Exterminatus. Exterminatus is a very crazy thing, there's only so many worlds that you don't want to destroy all of them. Uh, now naturally, with the memes aside, there are some people who are a little bit rough on this one. <coughs> <coughs> but most Inquisitors generally don't like to do Exterminatus a ton, but it is an option they have. And it's a crazy option when you think about it. Secret Police Inquisition are unfortunately not represented on the tabletop very much. You generally kind of put one in your army if you feel like it. You have a couple special options there and some side content, but they're not really fleshed out very well. And personally, they need a lot more stuff put in there and they, they really need a lot more effort put into them. And they're not quite where I want them to be. Overall, the Inquisition makes for a lot of the best storytelling as well, because it's a little bit hard to talk about a big story of a whole bunch of Space Marines killing something. Right? It's just a big battle story. It's not as interesting. Having that intrigue and that moral dilemma that an Inquisitor has makes for a lot better media. And honestly, the more people do it, I think it's better because then it adds a little more humanity to the Warhammer horrible, horrible grim darkness. And wow, we just finished the humans, all right? Come back for part two when we talk about Chaos and Xenos because we got to talk about the four Chaos Gods and all the Chaos Marine Legions and the Tau and the Necrons and the Orcs and oh boy, we got a lot. I'll see you in part two.